Good afternoon, Elizabeth Blumenstock here, and we're here with our first installment of Ask Elizabeth, in which I will answer a question put to me from a supporter. Our supporter in this case is R. Karen Lindgren, and she writes, my question is about the harpsichord in Baroque music. I would love to learn if this instrument is only for Baroque music and more history about how it became a statement of Baroque music. Thank you, Karen. What a fun question. Not much is known about the origin of the harpsichord, but an early version was probably constructed sometime in the early or middle 14th century, obviously well before the Baroque era. The main two components of the harpsichord are, well, they've been around for a long time, and the first one is the harp, which has been around in some form or another for at least 5,000 years. And the other component of the harpsichord, I mean, aside from things like the legs and the lid, is the keyboard. Well, keyboards have been around as part of organs since the organ was invented mm, 2,300 years ago or so. It seems like it's almost inevitable that so at some point some music-loving and mechanically-minded soul thought to put together a harp by lying it on its side and attaching it to a keyboard. And what a great idea that turned out to be. The earliest harpsichords were very small, apparently, from what we can see in various visual representations in paintings and the like. You're about to see a photo of an altarpiece from a church in Minden, Germany from 1425, and you can see just how very tiny this keyboard is. The harpsichord spread quite quickly across Europe largely because, at least the musicians would explain it, it was a fabulous accompanying instrument and people could play fantastic solos on it as well. Visual artists might have had a different explanation for its popularity. The Renaissance and Baroque periods were hotbeds of artistic and craftsman endeavors and the harpsichord clearly captured the imaginations of craftsmen and artists because not long after the harpsichord debuted on the scene, the instruments that they began building were just phenomenally beautiful, highly decorated in, in both their physical structure and their paint jobs and all the rest of it, just fantastically beautiful objects. These were seized upon by royalty, nobility, successful businessmen who bought them, uh, both as status symbols, as beautiful pieces of art, and of course for their musical entertainment value. I'd like to show you a couple of images of very beautiful harpsichords now. The first one was built by the Rooker's uh, harpsichord building dynasty uh, in 1643 and appears to have been commissioned for Marie Antoinette. The next image of a beautiful harpsichord was a harpsichord built by the Blanchet family of builders in 1765, and it was the last harpsichord they ever built. You may be wondering why that was the last harpsichord Blanchet ever built. Well, at the end of the 18th century, the harpsichord kind of dropped right out of the musical scene. The reason is that it had been overtaken in popular and musical taste by a new beast, the forte piano, which is the forerunner of the modern piano. The harpsichord went out of production and almost out of cultural memory until the beginning of the 20th century when there was another one of these periodic revivals of popular fascination with Baroque music and it was triumphantly returned to the concert hall. Where did all those harpsichords go after they stopped being played? Only a small handful have actually survived the, the three and 400 years since they were built. And most of the ones you can find now, very rare indeed, um, are in pitiable condition. Yes, they have not been cared for. They've been stashed away in attics, unused rooms, basements, all the rest of it. The wood has, has rotted. The paintings have, have chipped away. And, and uh, they're, they're, they're very pathetic looking things and you compare them with the beautiful images you saw earlier. The ones that were not actually relegated to really unsuitable environments that have, were kept in living rooms or bedrooms were often repainted, often clumsily, and often repeatedly. So the examples that we still have, the specimens we still have that were from the, their original periods, 
have to be painstakingly restored, exactly the same process as restoring a, a wonderful painting that has become grimed or damaged over the generations. I'd like to give you a website in case you're curious to see the fascinating restoration process. Uh, there's a wonderful harpsichord builder in Berkeley named John Phillips who does a great deal of restoration with his uh, assistant Janine Johnson, herself a fabulous harpsichord player and artist. And they have, they have done phenomenal work restoring many harpsichords. And you can see beautiful images of this process, quite fascinating, at this website. And a little footnote on the fate of harpsichords. Apparently, some harpsichords from the Paris Conservatory met a particularly sad and ignominious fate after the French Revolution. Between the prevalent, virulent, anti-aristocratic attitudes prevailing at that time and the dreadful poverty and fierce cold, the harpsichords, at least some of them, were broken up and burned for firewood. I'll return to the more recent history of the harpsichord before long, but first, let's take a look at what made the harpsichord so indispensable to Baroque music. I mentioned earlier its role as a solo instrument and as an accompanying instrument, and I'd like to delve a little into its role as an accompanying instrument first. The harpsichord, unlike, say, the trumpet or the bassoon, or really even the violin or the cello, has very rich harmonic potential. That is, it can produce rich and varied chords. This is a very good thing when you're accompanying. It just makes a more satisfying, full sound to accompany uh, I, I, a solo line, whether it's a voice or another instrument. The harpsichord was by no means the only harmonic instrument available to people during the Baroque era. There were various sorts and sizes of lutes, various sorts and sizes of organs, there were harps, there were quite a few possibilities, but somehow the harpsichord predominated. And we'll talk about why by looking at each of these instruments in turn. Let's consider some of the particular properties of each of them. We'll start with the lutes and the guitars. Well, in terms of number of strings, guitars and lutes had a range of between five for a smallish guitar, up to 26 for a largish lute or a theorbo. It's true that some of these 26 strings were doubled strings. You plucked them both at once for a little extra volume, right? But still, that's a pretty limited number when you compare the number of strings on a harpsichord, which by the time the Baroque era got going were probably somewhere between 40 and then up to a, even 120 strings as the harpsichord's keyboard got wider and wider. Harpsichords also used two sets of strings um, and often they had two keyboards, one stacked on top of the other, and each set of pluckers attached to the keyboards could, would pluck the string in a different part of the string along its length, which gave rise to a slightly different musical quality, a, a different timbre. So already with its huge number of strings and its different timbres, the, the harpsichord had a bit of an edge just in sheer range and power over the smaller fretted instruments, the lute and the guitar. In addition, on a harpsichord, the left hand, well, for you, maybe it would be over here, the left hand of the harpsichord uh, could play the written bass line all by itself, and the right hand was still free. And the right hand could then be uh, employed by plonking out the harmonies that the composer had indicated while the bass line was going, which change. But that isn't all that the harpsichord could then do. Creative harpsichordists were encouraged to make up, invent, improvise their own details, ways of connecting chords from one chord to the next, ways of rolling chords, even inventing little counter melodies to what the solo line was playing, or imitating the solo line. All of these, these techniques became a way of really enhancing the nature of the accompaniment. And that's really what Baroque accompaniment is all about, inventing things. The music you hear from the right hand of a good harpsichordist is not written down by the composer. All the composer has written is the bass line for the left hand and a group of numbers underneath the notes of the bass line which indicate what harmony should be played. Now, if you tried to do this kind of thing on a lute, you'd be in trouble, or a guitar, because you'd need both of your hands to make a sound at all. 
you put your finger down on a string, that doesn't make a sound. You have to pluck it with the other hand, right? So once you've done that, you only have, let's say, let's say you pluck that note with your thumb. Then you've got your other four fingers available to play the chord. And somehow you have to keep plucking those bass notes and try to keep plucking the, the new chords. And maybe you don't have quite so much freedom or time because of the load on the one hand here, on the right hand, to make up these beautiful little ornaments. Now, before I really annoy any lutenists or guitarists who happen to be listening right now, I hasten to say that a good guitarist or a good lutenist as an accompanist is a pearl beyond price. I've played with many of these pearls. I've been very fortunate. And I have to say, it is quite incredible how they can find the notes with the left hand, pluck the right string and keep that bass line going, mostly with their thumb, and use their other fingers for a fabulous combination of chordal realization, so you hear the harmonies, and ornamental filigree to complement the solo line. It's truly spectacular. And of course, there are some niche repertoires like lute songs, you know, which harpsichord would not be appropriate for because the composer has simply said, you must play the lute here. I also mentioned the harp as a harmonic instrument as well. And if popularity were just merely a matter of how many strings an instrument had, the harp could have been a contender. Uh, they have many strings, quite a few, depending on the size of harp, which did vary. Um, and I often have two sets or three sets of strings. Imagine trying to find three sets, parallel sets of strings into which your fingers must go and pluck the right string. Terrifying, right? terrifying, I can't imagine. Four strings is all I can handle. Um, but somehow the harp did not catch on as a really popular accompanying instrument. And there are probably several factors at work here. First, during this era, the harp became associated with ladies, young ladies at that. Young ladies did not perform in public. Young ladies had an obligation to flaunt their marriageability by demonstrating their, the, the, their acquisition of the gentle arts, such as reciting poetry, or drawing, or painting, or singing, or playing the piano, or the flute, or the harp. Right? Skilled artistry was not so much the point here. It was more about showing yourself off. right? So that was one factor, possibly. Um, a second factor is a, a little a characteristic of the harp. When you pluck a string on the harp, it resonates fully and for quite a long time. There's nothing damping it, right? So let's say you pluck a chord. Well, that chord sounds, there's a nice little impact at the beginning of the chord, and then that sound carries on, and then it's time to play another chord. And you pluck that chord, but the other chord with different strings has not died away in its sound, so you wind up hearing two chords at once, especially if the mu music is moving rapidly. Right? This creates a kind of a muddy or murky resonance, sort of like uh, too many noises in your bathroom. There's just a lot of echoing going on. And it's not entirely wonderful, right? not, not an entirely beautiful sound. It's atmospheric, certainly, but it's, it's maybe not quite clean and crisp and clear enough uh, to, to become super popular. Now, I said there was no way to damp it, and I lied. I lied. Of course, harpists do damp their strings. But when you're playing a fast piece of music as an accompanist in a, on the harp, the reality is your hands are needed for those notes that are coming thick and fast, those chords that are coming thick and fast, and you just aren't going to have time to damp the strings between everything, plus which it would sound a little peculiar. So I think that's another factor that limited the harp's popularity as an accompanying instrument. And the last factor um, is kind of speculative. In fact, all of this is somewhat speculative, but I think it's kind of on the beam. The harp is a notoriously difficult instrument. I mean, as I said, imagine you've got three rows of strings in between which your fingers must nimbly dive without plucking the ones on the outside. You want to get the one on the inside and get the right ones. And my gosh, I, crazy difficult, I think. Maybe there's something I don't know, but I, I suspect that it was extremely difficult. And there simply may not have been enough skilled and male players around. The last of our harmonic instruments, the organ, is definitely, in the words of our questioner, 
a statement of Baroque music in its own right. Surely with its wide range, uh, huge range, very big low notes, you can imagine, you've, you've probably heard Bach, Bach toccatas on a great organ and how low those low notes are, they rumble, and very high pipey oboesque notes, very high, huge range, huge array of tonal timbres brought about by various combinations of stops, and availability in small portable models, you would think all these features would make it a great accompanying instrument. No, maybe, maybe not. One of the characteristics of the organ is that when you hold a key down, it produces a consistent and unvarying sound until you lift your finger from the key. There's no way to soften the sound over the time that it's being played or to taper it away in any way. No dynamic variability. Once the finger's down, that's the sound, right? Now, this is not a, a big issue. Uh, uh, if you're playing fast music, you pop the notes, out they pop. They're, they're lively, the pitch is there, you, it, it's all good. But when you have a slow movement and you're playing chords to accompany, the, the notes in those chords are just going to come out without any nuance, without any variability, without any sensitivity to what's going on in the solo line. They're just there like a, a kind of like a, a, a hard wall of sound at you. This is not a great characteristic for accompanying. You want to be able to be responsive to the solo line. And dynamic variations, louds and softs, crescendos and diminuendos are really important. So there's that. In fairness, I should say that organists have developed a number of very clever tricks to create the impression of dynamic variation. And actual dynamic variation. Things like when they have a chord, they roll the chord so that it becomes fuller over a little period of time. When they want it to taper, they may release notes in reverse order or in some way so that by the end they're only playing one last little note. That creates some forte and piano in a, in a nice flow. And they can play more notes for more strength and fewer notes for a more piano effect. So it's not a hopeless thing. And in fact, the organ is used for accompaniment. Also, the organ was a, traditionally, you know, you see them in churches. And so they're kind of associated with sacred music. And that, that, that bond between organs and sacred music has had a, a strong resonance over the centuries. The harpsichord, not so much. It kind of uh, opportunistically and quite naturally took on the mantle of being the secular accompaniment instrument. Really, the last and probably most salient reason why the harpsichord is so associated with Baroque music is that, as I mentioned earlier, it was no longer used after the Baroque era. And so no later eras, no later periods of music have any association with it at all. Here is a short video example of a melody instrument with an accompanying harpsichord. Our performers are Ian Pritchard, who contributes his enormous talents to our June Festival opening, closing, and Wednesday Gardens concerts, and his wife Alexandra Opsal, herself also a frequent and brilliant collaborator with our festival. Here she's playing the cornetto, which is another Baroque instrument that fell out of use during the period. Alex and Ian are co-directors of the wonderful Renaissance and Baroque music ensemble called Tesserae, and for those of you who don't know about them, they're based in Los Angeles and are maintaining a creative online presence during the pandemic we are all still enduring. I strongly encourage you to visit their website for information about when and how you can hear them. Here is their website. You will now hear Ian and Alex play a canzona by the early 17th century composer Frescobaldi. Try to focus your ear on Ian's right hand. The notes he's playing there, these are the ones that are improvised and chordal. They tend to sit in pitch a bit lower than the solo line played by the cornetto, but quite a bit higher than the notes played in the bass line. So they're kind of in the middle zone. You'll notice that he mixes chords and ornamentation, connective tissue between the chords in the classic style of Baroque accompaniment.
don't want to neglect the harpsichord as a solo instrument here. Virtually every Baroque composer wrote some works, at least, and some many, for the solo harpsichord. So happily, the repertoire is immense. Here is Ian again, playing a very short and extremely beautiful prelude by Francois Couperin. You may associate the harpsichord solos with fast, lively playing, brilliant playing. Yes, that is certainly, there are plenty of pieces like that. But this particular piece shows the instrument's luxurious, sensitive, nuanced, and tender side. <laughs> I mentioned earlier the revival of the harpsichord in the early 20th century. This was brought about almost single-handedly, eh, two-handedly, double-handedly, by the formidable Wanda Landowska, who became fascinated with the harpsichord early in her career as a modern pianist. This surprising reappearance of a functionally extinct instrument comically puts me in mind of the big movie uh, 1993, Jurassic Park, uh, in which uh, extinct dinosaurs are genetically resurrected with horrifying and chaotic results. The harpsichords used by Ms. Landowska were not actually replicas of real Baroque instruments. They were more a hybrid of uh, the harpsichord and the grand piano with steel construction and six or seven pedals, things that were never seen or built that way during the Baroque era. Musicologist David Kiar describes the sound this way. A hybrid of a harpsichord, a pianoforte, hammered dulcimer, and mini Casio keyboard. I'm not sure if this is a compliment or not. Some people love the sound, others think it's a metallic monstrosity. Have a listen to some of her recordings and you be the judge. Landowska flourished in an environment which had already become receptive to the charms of Baroque music. And indeed, during the first part of the, the century, Bach, Handel, Telemann, and Vivaldi returned triumphantly to the concert hall. And this led to the full-fledged disinterment in the last 60, 70 years of practically every Baroque composer who ever lived and put pen to paper. In the last few decades, contemporary composers have taken an interest in the timbres and potential of not just the harpsichord, but all of the Baroque instruments, and have started composing music for them. There is now a considerable and respectable body of good repertoire for these instruments. So, finally, I can answer the question of whether the harpsichord is just for Baroque music. The answer is, happily, no. Thank you for listening. <laughs>